Yo, what's up? This is The Edge, and you already know it's the Creative Life Podcast, or I don't know, we talk about more than just a podcast. This is about a lifestyle. This is about direction, and we base everything pretty much on those five pillars, and the pillars are mindset, self-mastery, financial freedom, community slash networking, and ultimately, lifestyle leisure. And today, we're fortunate enough to have one of the greatest football players that ever played a game in Devin Hester. You know, he's one of the guys that we already know that he's supposed to be in the Hall of Fame, but we'll get to that a little bit later. But we're glad to have you on. I think this show right here is going to show a lot of people a lot more about Devin Hester and the mindset of what it takes to be one of the top 100 football players of all time. And you're talking about all the people that ever played the game. And this guy right here is one of the guys that is one of the top 100. Think about all the thousands of people that have played the game. And this guy right here is somebody that is from Florida, went to the University of Miami, the greatest school ever. And he's one of the top players to ever play the game. And I'm still wondering why one of the top players in the game still don't have that gold jacket. So Devin Hester, man, glad to have you here. And, you know, it's an honor for people to get a chance to really listen to you speak about what it takes to become one of the greatest. And for myself, you know, if, if I'm on the other side and I'm looking at this thing and I'm saying, okay, you know, there has to be a certain type of mindset that a player has to have or a person has to have knowing they're coming from similar situations to so many other kids and so many other people that have made or had potential to make it, but also maintain that focus to become one of the greatest. So when I, when I say what was the mindset of Devin Hester to say, I'm going to be one of the greatest to play the game. I think, to, to be honest with you, man, that, that mind focus um, in our situation, man, um, I know, man, you can relate to this. It starts at an early age. Um, we don't we don't plan this when we're in high school. This is something that I feel like comes upon us in our lifestyle, our situation um, at a very early age. I can probably say around that age, six, seven years old, where you had that mindset that you start building it, you start believing it. Um, you start preparing yourself for life to say that one day I will make it, you know what I mean? And and I hate to say it, but in our community, we felt like football or the street life was the way out. Like we didn't know no other way, you know what I mean? We, didn't, we wasn't raised to have the mindset that one day I'm gonna be a doctor. I'm going to be a lawyer, you know what I mean? We knew that either the street life or being an athlete was going to get us out of our situation. And so I chose sports, you know what I mean? And um, mm-hmm. I knew what it took. I didn't know what it take, took to make it there, you know what I mean? But I knew that it wasn't going to come easy, you know what I mean? And I was unfortunate, I hate to say it, but I was one of the kids that, you know what I mean, I put all my eggs in one basket. And I felt like, if I ain't put all my eggs in one basket and I put 70% of my eggs in one basket, I'm making a football and the other 30 and something else, then I wasn't giving 100%. And that's the mindset I had, man. I knew that I had to outwork everybody and I had to be more talented than everybody to, to, to get out of the situation I wanted to be in. And, and that's why it drove me to be to become one of, one of the greatest to ever do it. But when you, when you talk about, like, at a young age, you don't know – you know, the size or you don't know all the physical attributes that you're going to actually have because, you know, you're not one of the biggest guys. Right. You know, you wasn't one of the fastest guys. Right. But on the football field, you was the best. So if I'm talking to a kid that is – that's wanting to, like, hey, I'm going to be like Devin Hester, you know, but he really don't know, he really don't have any kind of information, what would you tell somebody to say, man, look, Look, this is what it takes to be one of the greatest. Somebody can't want it better than you. 
And I always had that that saying from a coach growing up that if I wanted better than you, then you you in the wrong sport. You know what I mean? So I, I pushed myself to the limit. You know what I mean? I made sure that I did everything that it took more and beyond to be that guy. You know what I mean? And it wasn't easy, to be honest with you, man. Nothing in life is easy. And... It's only a select few that can say that they're the greatest to ever do it. You know what I mean? When you hear Michael Jordan talk, you hear about the stories that he he went through and and how a lot of people hated him because he didn't take light practices or or people half-assing on his team. He didn't didn't sit well with him. And as a person like myself, you know what I mean, I always try to be perfect. You know what I mean? I wanted to be perfect in whatever I did. So when I mess up on something or I drop a ball or I drop a punt or something like that, it ate me up to the point where coaches would say, this kid is crazy. Like, I remember in Chicago, my first rookie year, and I drop a punt. And I would throw the ball in the woods and say, we're not using that ball no more. Like, I had the mentality, like, that was a curse. You know what I mean? And you got to have that type of mindset. You know what I mean? If you don't, man... You're going to blend in with everybody and you're going to be a normal dude. But if you had a mindset that I'm striving for excellence, I'm striving for, for, for greatness and, and to be perfect, man, and you believe in that, man, it, it'll come. But when you, you know, you, when you're the first to do something, or, you know, usually you have an example. Everybody usually has an example, but you didn't grow up with people that saying, this is what you need to do or this is how you're going to do it. How did you know that, like, man, hey, I'm going to be one of the best players to ever play this game, but you don't have no measuring stick, you don't know anybody, you didn't grow up with somebody that say these are the things you have to do. How did you find it in yourself or what resources or who did you look up to to say, man, I'm going to be like him or these are the things that it takes? Because we usually need examples. Mm. We need somebody to say this is the way you do it or this is how you do it, but to be the one of the greatest of all time, you know that's that comes from a, another space, another right. place, right? You no, know, for yourself. So, where did you find that mindset to say, man, look, or what examples that you were given? Because, mm. you know, earlier you said, you know, we got two choices from athletics or from the streets, and there's so many examples in the streets, right? That you could have kind of leaned on, but you chose athletics and I don't know too many people that came from where Riviera Beach, right. Sun Coast. I don't know too many people that say, "Oh, yeah, this is the guy I'm gonna be better than him." And usually, people measure things up from the people that they know. So, right, right. who were the people that said, "Hey," or who were the people that you looked at and said, "Man, I'm gonna be better than him"? Yeah. To be honest, we we didn't we didn't really have no people like that in our city. I think Anthony Carter was really the only athlete that rung a bell in the city of Riviera Beach. Um, Played at Michigan and, and played for the Minnesota Vikings. Um, but other than that, that small town of Rivera Beach, we didn't really have no athletes that really stood out like that. Um, and so I think what really struck the momentum and the, and the mindset of this is what, what was given to me. This was a blessing. Was it? I feel like it. You know, I'm a spiritual person. I'm a spiritual a spiritual person. So. I feel like I, I, it was a sign from God, you know what I mean, to be honest with you. Uh, from the first moment I played pop, won the football, first play of the game, man, first time putting on a helmet and shoulder pads, first play of the game, I take a pick six to the house, you know what I mean? And then I get to high school on varsity football as a true freshman, first carry I touch is to the house. Then I get to the University of Miami, you know what I mean, first time touching the ball in orange boat, 92-yard touchdown. To when I get to the NFL, you know what I mean? First game of my NFL career, I take a punt back. You know what I mean? So certain for me it was a sign from God that say it was like, listen, if you if you believe and you strive for greatness, I give it to you. And I think that was my strongest assets that I was strong believing and he continued to show me signs that I would one day be one of the greats. But you know, like coming up, you know, we have, especially on the part one of the fields, you have a lot of kids that don't have their father figure, they don't have somebody there. Mm-hmm. And unfortunate for you, you had 
the loss of your father. You had somebody. Yeah, you, know, you had to find somebody to lean on, somebody to be that manly figure. Because there's so many kids that don't have somebody in their life that pushed them. Yeah. Like what pushed you? Because that's that's something that I like that I really don't understand with so many kids. They have people that push them, and then you have somebody that lost their creator, so mm-hmm. to speak. But they found that motivation. They found that push. What pushed right. you to become one of the greatest? Yeah, I, like you said, I lost a father, my father at an early age. I believe like around nine years old. Um, but my father wasn't. He wasn't a sports type person. Um, my mom remarried when I was about three years old, and my um, stepfather he was into sports. You know what I mean? I could honestly say that he was one of the reasons why I. Um, I started liking football. You know what I mean? I, he was the type of guy where he would go out on Sundays and play pickup football in the parks. You know what I mean? I would watch him. You know what I mean? I watched him and his brother. His brother uh, played football. And it was played like, you know what I mean, little city league football leagues and stuff like that. So I would go out there and watch that. And, you know, he would, um, you know, watch football games with me and explain to me, like, these type of kids, these type of players are what they did and, and, and how they're able to live life and provide for the families and stuff like that. And it kind of grew on me, you know what I mean? And it, and it was something that I, I really gained passion for, you know what I mean? I enjoyed it, you know what I mean? So it was, for me, it was a way out, you know what I mean, from from staying out of trouble, you know what I mean? It humbled me to, you know what I mean, where I knew that schoolwork was important, that I couldn't play without it, um, you know what I mean? So I had I had that, that, that stepfather in my life that kind of pushed the football towards me, but I also had a bigger brother, you know what I mean, that did it. And, uh, you know, I would always try to, Whenever you have a bigger brother that plays sports, you would always try to assemble him or try to be like them. So I was around two two manly guys in my household that that that, that strive for it and, and, and pushed me to play football. So yeah, that's pretty cool right there. I think a lot of people need to really hear that because yeah, everybody has somebody that they can look to or lean on. Right. And you've identified the two people that actually push you in that direction. And you know, fast forward, you know, you play at Riviera Beach and then you go to the University of Miami. And once you get to the University of Miami, like, what was the mindset? Okay, you're going to the U. Right. You know, you're going to the school where a lot of our, like, idols played mm-hmm. at. And that was where we say, okay, we're going to come here. We're going to really do exactly what we've been doing. Right. You know, a lot of times you get guys come to college and they feel like they've made it, mm-hmm. you know. And we're still talking about the mindset of a person that's coming from part one of having success, high school having success, and now you're at the University of Miami and you get to measure up with some of the best and you play on some of the greatest teams of the University of Miami or in the University of Miami history. You know, what kept that drive or what was it in you that made you say, man, look, no, it don't matter where I'm at. You know, I came here to do what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. And you actually had success. So right. what was it that when you made that transition from the University of Miami, I mean from River Ever Beach yeah. to the University of Miami, you know, what was the difference and was there a mindset shift? I think my I I I've, I've been through so many trials and tribulations that you know what I mean? I personally feel like I had one of the hardest roles to even get to college. You know what I mean from me being ineligible my, my first year. You know what I mean? People don't know, a lot of people don't know that I came out of 2000, I came out, of, I graduated 2002, right? And so I took my SAT my junior year, right? So when you take your SAT, you got like a two, three week span where they give you back your, your, your scores and you good to go. If you don't get them scores back in two, three weeks, it's a problem. I took my SAT my junior year, qualified and everything, went through my whole senior year, and just made sure I work on my GPA. Got my GPA up to about a 3.2. So I was good my whole senior. I took my SAT my junior year. Went through my senior year, pumped my GPA up to about a, a 3.2. I get ready to go to college. But in that meantime, I had a, a, a college that, you know what I mean, was really, really highly trying to recruit me. And it got to the point where I decided my my beginning of my senior year that I would, I would come into University of Miami because I was just tired of all the recruiting stages and all the phone calls and stuff. So pretty much got up, guy got upset and told me, you know what I mean? If you don't come here, I promise you'll never play a down to football in your life. 
You know what I mean? So that situation, I shook that off. My, I had him, my mom had a little conversation, and they worked that out or whatever happened. But going into college, I get into checking the dorms the first the first day of checking in, and then I get the guy that comes come tell me I'm gonna to play football. So I set out my whole first year of college football. You know what I mean? I went home. You know what I mean? And so in my situation, bro, you go home and like, you get something taken away from you. What you lean on? Yeah, you gonna lean on your past. You, you gonna, gonna lean, lean on, on past. You know what I mean? I, the family I got. Next thing, I, I I'm not in school. You know what I mean? I don't have a job. So what I go? It's either now. Do I lean on going out in the streets? I, so shoot, my first two, three months, I stayed in the house. I ain't even leave my bedroom, man. You know what I mean? So, and it ended up working out where it, it was a crazy situation with the NCAA. They told me I just, after about two, three months that I was in to play, I had to sit out the whole year, and they said, you qualified to go the next year. So for a kid like me, man, to sit out a whole year, not knowing what I'm going to do in life, you know what I mean? And all I knew was football and had that taken away from me, man, and then get hope that, you know what I mean, we're just a false false communication or whatever they did, you know what I mean, and, and allowed me to play football, man. I was so determined that if I ever get an opportunity, man, to play football again, man, you know what I mean, them first three, four months of sitting at home, knowing I should have been in school, I told myself if I ever get an opportunity, I'm going to make sure that I, do, I make the best of it, regardless of what I play, what position I play, I'm going to dominate it. And I had that whole mindset of just sitting home, man, just thinking that once I get the opportunity again, if I, it, and if I do, because I didn't know at that time whether I was going to play football or not, that if I do, I'm going to make the best of it. So do you think that right there was a driving point or that right there was something that really triggered everything? Because, yeah. you know, I can, I can just imagine being a high school athlete. You know, you go through the whole parade of getting – the scholarship and going to the University of Miami, but going to whatever college you're going to, and then all of a sudden for it to be taken away from you. Yeah. You know, and football is all you know. Right, right, right. And then all of a sudden it's taken away from you. Right. And now you got to kind of go back and regroup. Yeah. So within that regrouping, you know, if you didn't get a chance to go back to University of Miami or if you didn't get a chance to get back in school, where would Devin has to be right now? I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> I know that for a fact. We wouldn't be having this conversation, man. You know what I mean? That that's a hard, hard topic to try to figure out what would I be doing if I didn't get the opportunity again. You know what I mean? Um, like I said, I'm I'm blessed that everything worked itself out, man. You know what I mean? I was able to get continue to play what I love doing, which is football. You know what I mean? And so I think that was one of the reasons why I had the passion. And the drive. Maybe it was a learning experience for me to say that, you know what I mean? Maybe I wasn't ready that year. You know what I mean? Maybe it would God was showing me a sign that, you know what I mean, I could have had a freak injury my freshman year going in there, you know what I mean, where I was unable to play football for the rest of my life. So I looked at it as that and I also looked at it as that whoever did that, you know what I mean, I made sure that I showed them that at the end of the day you ain't got the best of me. You know what I mean? And and I it's a story that I have. I tell it every now and then, but I, I told my special, um, my um, strength coach, Andrew Swayze, I told him, I said, listen, man, we playing um, in the Orange Bowl. We playing against Florida Gators. You know what I mean? First game first game of the season. And I told him, I said, man, listen, I got too much built up on my shoulder, man, for just sitting out this year. I said, man, listen, I got an opportunity to be the first person to touch the ball in this game. I said, listen, if... If I touch the ball, I'm going to score, and I'm going to take my helmet off, and I'm going to look that camera in the face, and I hope that person that did this to me is looking at me, and I'm going to show him what he really did to a kid that, you know what I mean, love football. You know what I mean? You try to take in my career by doing this, and it was just a situation where he was able to do it, you know what I mean, at the moment, but it didn't keep me down. But I made sure that, hey, listen, man, if I touch the ball, and I told him, if I touch this ball, it's going to the hall. And before I cross that end zone, I'm coming up out my helmet and I'm going to stare that camera in the face. And I hope that guy watch. And that's what I did. Yeah, that's pretty dope right there. But that's those are the things. Like, everybody got to try to find that drive. And you found that drive in that situation. And you just never know. It's a gift that you probably didn't even know that you was going to receive. Right, right. And now you're driven to become one of the best to ever play the game. 
And I can just imagine the feeling that you had when you crossed that finish line or got in that end zone yeah. and been able to take that helmet off and do what Miami Hurricanes do. Right. So that's that's pretty dope, man. But it's 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 one of those things that I think a lot of a lot of these kids need to really take heed to because there's always gonna be some adversity. Always. And always. You know, it's one saying that I got from the University of Miami. We had the chaplain that would always come. He would say, adversity causes some people to break, mm-hmm. others to break records. Yeah. And you define that. You are a perfect example of somebody that took a little adversity yeah. and made it go break records. You know, for you to be able to go on and say, man, look, you know, I'm going to continue doing this. Mm-hmm. What gave you the focus to say, man, look, okay, I received that success, but I want more. Yeah. I think in my situation, man, it was, I was the type of player where my my belly didn't get full. And what I mean by that was you have a lot of kids, uh, a lot of players, you know what I mean, make one or two plays, and they satisfied. Like, I never felt like I was, I wasn't satisfied because I felt like I had more, I left more out there, you know what I mean? And so I was one of the type of players where I, I was striving for greatness my rookie year. But what is greatness? Like, what what is greatness um, to you? I feel like I feel like greatness is when you're doing something that nobody would imagine you to do. Like, it's it's stuff that's impossible. Like, that's the stuff that I want to do. I don't want to do stuff that's normal. Or, Oh wow, he did that. That that's cool. You know what I mean? I want the people. When I my mindset was, I want to do stuff that people didn't even imagine. So who would like? Person. You had to have an example. You had to have somebody like, hey, I want to be better than this guy. Or I want to be better than that guy. So you know, once you fast forward, get to the university. I mean, leave the University of Miami. Yeah. And you get to the pros, you have to have certain people. Or where is the measure? Where, where where do you measure greatness in your field? And knowing that, okay, you play DB, mm-hmm. you play wide receiver, and a kickoff return specialist, where did you sit up and say, I'm going to be great in this field or this what is this what greatness is to me and that's why I'm going to prove to you this is greatness? Because you got to have somebody right. that's a barometer that says, hey, this is the best to ever do it. So how did you – Define greatness one, and then who were the people that you say? Long as I'm doing better than this person, yeah. Because as a running back, right, right. You know, we got a list of guys, right. And we go through and say, you know, long as I'm in this company, right. I already knew I done made my mark. And well, so for yourself, yeah. Well, I think um, I had a great special team coach by the name of Dave Tote, uh, which is the Kansas City special team coach right now. And um, this guy been around for a while, and. He's a number guy, and what I mean by that is he he looks at all the accolades, he look at all the statistics of the previous punt returners, the top punt returners in the country. You know what I mean? Part, top kickoff and punt returners in the NFL history. You know what I mean? And he would show me the numbers, and you know what I mean. He would break it down to the point where listen, if you want to be the best guy at the position, you know what I mean. This guy such and such, he got three returns this year, in one year. You know what I mean? This is a, a position that if you take two, two, maybe three kickoffs back in a year, you're solidified as one of the greatest to do it. You know what I mean? And so when I looked at that chart and I seen that oh, all you need is three point returns in one year, you know what I mean? To, to be considered as the best in, in that career in, or in that year, you know what I mean? And I told myself, man, like, listen, this, with that mindset, two or three is cake, you know what I mean? And I came out my first, my rookie year, and I took back six. I said, well, whatever that is, I'm going to double that, you know what I mean? And so that right there kind of, like, put a stamp on my mind and say, okay, if, I, if they taking three back, I'm going to bust my tail and I'm going to do whatever it takes, and I'm going to double that number, you know what I mean? And that's how I kind of solidified it, and I, I looked at it was I. Like, I looked at numbers the way he broke it down, and he explained to me everything is broken down in stats. You know what I mean? If you can, if you can crush this stat, then you you consider one of the greats. 
And you that's the way they my, look at it. No, I, like, I, I, I like that you're saying that because you identify something. So, so for myself and for people that's, that's paying attention, you know, you talk about, you know, becoming great or being successful. You know, you came from a position where you played defensive back, you played wide receiver, but you chose to be a specialist. Mm-hmm. to be the greatest at. Right. And, you know, the lesson I get from this right here is identifying what you want to do or what you have potential to be great in right. and disregard all the other things because you could love to, like you could have loved to be been a defensive back. You could have loved to have been a wide receiver. Right. But you chose a space that you saw that say, I can attack this. Yeah. I can be yeah. one of the best of the best in this. Right. And I think that right there is an important message because a lot of people, they're all over the place. Mm-hmm. But when you recognize your gift or you recognize things that come to you easy or effortless, right. now you got a chance to really position yourself. And it's like in success, you talk about, you know, what does it take to be successful? Right. And all it takes is one thing. So yeah. identifying that one thing and you've identified the one thing that you could be great in, Facts. which took you to another level. And I think so many people need to understand that, man, it's, you can't be this person or that person. You got to be your person. You right. got to understand that this is what I can be good at, and I'm going to take this to a whole another level. Facts. Yeah. That, like you said, you hit it right on the head. And um, I, guess, well, I can remember recalling... Um, we had a speaker at University of Miami too that used to come out and uh, and we played on Saturdays. I think sometimes he came out maybe Friday before we took off and he was a guest speaker and he would you know break down some light lessons and really encourage us. And the one thing that he said that stood out to me was exactly what you're saying. You know what I mean? Everybody has a role. You know what I mean? But whatever your role is in life, whether it's being the best father, being the best worker, being the best garbage man, whatever it is that you're good at, be the best at it. And when he said that, you know what I mean? And I was in a situation where I had a role of just doing returns. I said, you know what? Regardless of me wanting to be a wide receiver, a kickoff, punt return, or a cornerback, or a running back, whatever it is that I really want to be, whatever I'm great at, master it. You probably was like, man, you know what? They ain't going to put me on that field as a wide receiver. Yeah, I ain't going to give them a chance to get that ball. Exactly, man. So <laughs> I, I told myself, you know what, man? Listen, if I'm going to be a kickoff and punt returner, shit, hell with it. I'm going to be the best to ever do it. And that's the mindset that I had when he said that at the, at the time where I was, you know what I mean, I was back and forth from playing against some playing time, you know what I mean, from some little altercation going on at school. But... When I found myself having just burned by kickoff and punt return, I said, you know what? I'm going to be the best to ever do it. You know what I mean? And I had a, like I said, I had a coach tell me, you ain't going to be nothing but a kickoff and punt return. And I took that as a as an insult. They said, you know what? If I am, fuck it. I'm going to be the best to ever be do it. Be the best. Yeah. Right, that's, that's what I'm talking about with mindset. And then you're talking about some mindset. We go back into self-mastery. You have identified all the things that, that was from internal yeah and so when when i'm listening to this is if i'm an offensive player and i'm like man hester about to get on i'm probably hey i know i want the team win but we all want some stats right, right. And i'm like man hester finna take off some of these percent some of these carries that i'm probably gonna get right but that all goes to your mindset and that's what a lot of people need to hear because you know the difference in mindset is the difference in how far you go, what you achieve, yeah. how you go about things. Right. And so you took something where somebody felt like they was probably insulting you or mm-hmm. kind of trying to get under your skin, right. and you made it to where, hey, I'm going to use this to become one of the greatest to ever do it. Yeah. So, you know, part of the the five pillars that we have in the Creative Life um, program or overall program you always talk about financial freedom, and that thing is very important as an athlete, especially knowing that the history of athletes, for whatever reasons, I think we both know that it's not a fair assessment, but it always try to point a bad light on athletes, and the statistics show 
that 78% of our athletes, you know, end up broke or under financial financial distress. And that's one thing we want to try to do. We want to try to change the narrative. We want to try to make sure we shed light on so many different situations. And you being a former athlete that actually played the game, made millions of dollars, and now you're in a position of where they're going to judge you, saying, hey, is he broke? Do he have money? Where he's sitting at? You know? And so I think it's important to have those discussions and actually not just get on one side or the other, but kind of, you know, look into the why. You know, why is it that after all these years and all this information, all this data, you're always hearing that the percentages of the athletes, it never moves. The needle never moves. Why do you think the needle isn't moving? And you know, not to dig into your personal stuff, and mm-hmm. I, I know you personally, you know, and where you fit in that overall grand scheme of thing. Right. I think, um, to be honest, a lot of us that come from where we come from, we don't look into how to manage money. We never was put in a position to know that in a position where we never had that much money. You know what I mean? So the little money that we we were around growing up and we look at our elders, they all manage their own money because at the end of the day, it ain't a lot to manage. You know what I mean? So I think right now in the situation where we need help is to, like if I can do it all over again, I feel like, if when when I got to college, I would take more. I would go more into business. On I would have took more classes than and to learning how to invest my money to learn it. But remember, if you take business, you take away from football. Football facts. So facts. that's something you got to take in consideration. Yeah. yeah, that and like you said, that's the key. You know what I mean? Um, uh, that's that's a fact. You know what I mean? But. What I did, to be honest with you, man, my first my first couple of years in the league, and to be honest, everybody's not gonna be blessed to be to be able to do that. You know what I mean? I came out hot my first two years. You know what I mean? To making the Pro Bowl my first two years, to winning the ESPYS my rookie year. You know what I mean? Like so, when no when you get those type of compliments, you get endorsement deals. So my first three four years, I lived on. Lived off straight endorsements. You know what I mean. I didn't have to touch my check. You know what I mean. And so, I grew up in the old age where you know what I mean. Where the way I budget myself was almost almost like street street common sense to the point where I said, you know what, I, I'm gonna pay my own bills, right? Because I want to learn how to do it. So I, I, it was fun for me. I had a big binder where I bought every year, and I wrote down when I pay my bill, what date, how much it was, who I paid it to. I did that. I had my own little office. I took a room in my house. I had a, 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 a um, townhouse, and I had set up a little office. I said, you know what? I want to learn how to do this. You know what I mean? I see my mama do this all the time growing up. Let me learn how to do this. So I did that stuff, and I educated myself on that, you know what I mean, paying every bill every month on my own, you know what I mean, to the point where I said, you know what I mean, I'm going to take out $5,000 in cash, you know what I mean, and I'm not touching nothing else. I'm going to take that $5,000 out and I'm going to live off that $5,000 for the rest of this month, spending-wise, you know what I mean? Like, I budget myself like that. And like I say, everybody that make it to the league not going to be able to be blessed to say, you know what, I can live off straight endorsement deals for the first four or five years. You know what I mean? You, you, it's not realistic. You know what I mean? So if you don't have that situation where you're able to live off endorsement deals, now you got to dig into your, your 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 salary. You know what I mean? Now what you can't do is you can't keep up with the guys that's been in the league four or five, that's been in the league six, seven years before you because those guys are on their second contract. You got to think about it. Now, they cut the salary down from back in the day when Edgewood was playing with the first rounder, the first top five picks, they get $50, $60 million off rip. So that salary got cut down to, to when, when I got came out, you know what I mean? It was it was lower. So from that point on, like me, like I said, I lived off my 
endorsement deals, you know what I mean, to the point where you got to start picking. What I did was I started picking some of these older guys' brains, you know what I mean, in the locker room, like, bro, like, who your financial dude is, you know what I mean? And from that point on, I said, well, well who, what clients do he have? Because at the end of the day, if you go with a financial dude and he got Joe Blow and Billy Thompson, people you don't know, that's a sign. Now, if he got Edge and Jane, Peyton Manny, um, Michael Irvin, um, these top guys, that's a sign that he know what he's doing. You know what I mean? So, like, you got, as an athlete coming into the league, you got to realize, I want to be in a situation and I want to be around these guys because I know they, I know a guy like Andrew Jane, you know what I mean? If I come to the league, he already been in the league four or five years before me, you know what I mean? That he knows, he don't maybe, like I hate to say it, but he maybe don't took a little bump where he picked the wrong guy to the point where he realized that I learned from that guy, you know what I mean? Now I'm, I'm with a good guy that I, that I can trust, you know what I mean? So, a lot of guys, they go wrong when they start picking guys that, okay, me and you got drafted. I'm going to go with your guy because I don't know who to pick. You know what I mean? Me and you got drafted the same year, but I'm going to go with your guy. Instead of going with a veteran guy that's been in the years, in the, in year, he's in year eight, nine, and he's like, bro, I had this guy for almost five, six years, and I never had a problem. Well, like smart people follow smart people. Facts. You know, so it seems like you follow somebody else that's been there, done yeah. that, versus – Going out to this new person, going out to and them. I think that's a that's a good approach. And we have so many different situations, so many different scenarios, to where, you know, when you come into this situation, remember you're the first one or the first generation of getting wealth or the first generation right. of wealth that you're seeing. So beyond you doing all that stuff for yourself, you know, you're gonna have family, friends. You're going to have all these people pulling at you. How did you go about that situation? Because so many athletes, right. you know, they really don't know how to handle it. And yeah. majority of the time, when we talk about that 78% yeah. of athletes that don't have, right. a lot of the family, friends, or the unknown people mm. that enter their life, yeah. you know, they come in, they play a big part. So for yourself, you know, how, did you, how did you escape that? When my mom told me, listen, Devin, make sure you okay first before you start helping me out. Don't worry about nobody else in the family. You know what I mean? Make sure that you're comfortable. Everything is situated with you. You have you have a nice place to stay. You got a transportation. You know what I mean? Make sure you straight. Because at the end of the day, as an athlete, man, you're going to have so many people coming at you when they start seeing that dollar sign. Because at the end of the day, that dollar sign is going to show across that TV. There's no way to hide it. So everybody going to know how much you got. You know what I mean? And when you got a strong mama, you know what I mean? Everybody don't have, everybody not raised by their mama. Everybody not raised by their grandma. You know what I mean? It may be adopted. But you're going to have that strong person in your in your life where you you know at the end of the day, when I make it, I got to make sure that I take care of them. You know what I mean? Regardless. And, it, and, and the hardest part about athletes that come through as brought up in a situation where, you know what I mean, your background is not so 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 good, you know what I mean, where you have a lot of struggle people in your family. The hardest part about that situation, the word is one word. No. It's so hard to say no. And you got millions right, of dollars. Right, 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 right. You know, and they say, man, this is this is only um a drop in the bucket yeah. to what you have. Yeah. You know, how are you gonna like defend yourself because Let's be honest, we can't never say, I don't have it. Like at the end of the day, your, your loved ones, the real ones, going to show you they really love you because they're going to say, all real, D, go ahead, take care of yourself, make sure you happy, make sure you straight, and then if you have a little son after, just throw it to me, you know what I mean? And at the end of the day, I don't mind giving people like that money, you know what I mean? Like my auntie, you know what I mean? D, I don't need nothing for I don't, I'm straight, you good, as long as you happy, I'm happy. Then you start realizing who really love you and who really just for the money. And that's something that I had to learn with family members, man. There's certain ones that I help out, you know what I mean, that I show favor to them because I knew from day one they was rocking with me. I think everybody that's in this position, they deal with this in some shape or fashion. And you hate to see the money divide right. the family, but it's going to do it. You know, yeah. it's going to happen. The thing that I've always found a joy in is the youth. Mm -hmm. And I know you deal a lot 
with the youth. You're in the community. You're doing your service to the community, which a person can't really bash you or a person can't really say, oh, you don't do this or you don't do that because, you know, from speaking with you, you know, you carry a whole youth football program and not getting any type of donations. But those things aren't going to be highlighted. Mm -hmm. You know, those things aren't going to be echoed from the people that's asking you for money, Yeah, which it's not fair to you, but I think that's an internal thing where you're doing it from a personal satisfaction and you know you're doing what's right. Mm -hmm. You know, but I know... I know we've spoken in the past and, you know, dealing with the youth football, you know, you know, you have some concerns about right. how it's being handled. Right. And those things, um, I ain't gonna say they pretty much need to be addressed, but they need to be brought to the light because, you know, you have a person like yourself that's out there giving himself a hundred percent of himself and his financials, and then you have parents mm -hmm. that approaching you or thinking their child is this or that, how do you deal with that? Because I've been in the Pop Warner youth yeah. football field, and for myself, it kind of kills the spirit right. when you're forced or you're put in a situation where the kid may not be up to par or the kid mm -hmm. may not be as good as his family thinks he is. Right. But to to kind of ease the situation or to make the day better, mm. you kind of accommodate those situations. So how do you deal with that? Let me start off by saying this, man. Like, the reason why I retired from football is because I lost the passion for it. You know what I mean? To the point where I was driving to work and I was saying, questioning myself, like, why? Why are you still doing it? You know what I mean? Why are you still playing football if, if it's not exciting to you? You know what I mean? Showing up to games, not even excited about the game. So I, to be honest, I, the reason why I retired because I lost the passion. And my middle son um, pretty much just took out the meat, man. And the day he was born, man, he everything he did was all about sports. Like... I don't remember like when for for him shopping for Christmas, like everything I bought from the day he was born came from Dick Sporting Goods. No toys, no trucks, no trains, no video games. Everything was pertaining sports. And so when he was old enough to play sports, I gained the passion back. And so that what drove me to 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 get involved in the youth world. And so from speaking of that, man, like to this day, bro. I got kids at my house right now. From from the that's youth on this football team program. for youth football right now, at my house and spending the night like bro like I don't do this bro and I gain the passion and I don't do this for the fame or publicity bro uh, to say that you know what I mean I'm coaching the football team I don't do that for that bro like cause I love football and so I get these these negative vibes from the parents you know what I mean where like you just you hit on the topic the about. The biggest topic right now is social media is taking over and it's ruining a lot of parents and some of the kids' mind. And and they they looking at football another way and it, it's all about who has the highlights, who has the most followers on on Facebook or Instagram and stuff like that. That's taking over and ruining a lot of kids, man. And and for the parents, you know what I mean. To, to sit here and, and go off on, on coaches, regardless of who it is, man, whether it's me or any coaches, and to to, to, to bring up this situation where it's they're, they're, the biggest issue is a lot of parents are saying that a lot of coaches are playing daddy ball. And that's the topic that I want to hit on because I get it a lot, you know what I mean, from my kid, right? They're, the, the, the biggest topic right now in youth football is – Daddy ball. I deal with that. You know, daddy uh, ball. So I so I try to figure out. I say, okay, well, explain daddy ball to me, right? Because if 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 Adrian James is 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 the coach, right? We all know who Adrian James is, right? Played over ten years in the NFL, first round draft pick. You don't think his kid is good? 
He got this kid. His kid has in-house coaching from the moment he go to football practice to the moment he get home before he start the season. All that. So you don't think his kid is gonna be ninety percent of the time one of one of the best kids on the team? Parents are so strong-minded. Half of them don't even, they don't even know football. What I feel like a lot of parents are doing, they're ruining a lot of good coaches. And I'm just speaking for myself. You know what I mean? I told my wife, like, listen, bro, I don't know if I want to do this again next year. You know what I mean? Because the simple fact, like, you got a coach that don't play over 10 years in the league, coaching your kid, teaching them the right, proper way of football. Right? The right proper way, everything that needs to be taught at the end of the day, and then you want you sit here and say, Well, damn, his kid, when you watch his kid practice, he does everything right. Right? When he's running the ball, one on one drill, he hardly get tackled. When he's playing corner, he's playing great defense. He's catching the ball. He know how to line up. He know how to read defenses. You got a Hall of Fame coach training your kid for free four or five days out of the week. For free. But you want to sit here and critique him and, and tell him that he's playing dead of ball because his kids want to start playing on the team? Nah, his kid is getting a proper training so he know how to play. Is it dead of ball when that kid is getting the ball a lot but he's scoring touchdowns every time? Would it be dead of ball if the superstar kid, the superstar was on the team and was scoring all the touchdowns and all of a sudden you find out he he's the, the coach's son? Is it dead of ball then? That's my question, because I get that a lot with my kid. You know what I mean? Everybody say I'm playing data ball. All right? It's three games going. We had three games already in the season. My kid scored eight touchdowns. That's where I'm coming from. Like, that's a big topic that I need to hit on from Orlando, and I'm glad that Edge J gave me the opportunity to have this platform to speak on this. But listen, when you when you calling out data ball, make sure you saying it in the right way. I understand exactly where you're coming from. And for myself... I found myself in a situation where <clears throat> my kid had to take the back seat. Yeah. And it's not fair to my kid right. because you're just trying to make sure that everybody understands, like, hey, we're here as a team and we're trying to do what it takes to win, but keep everybody together. Keep everybody happy. But one thing I started doing, I started, you know, I started inviting the parents to practice. Yeah. And when it comes to hitting drills, bring your kid up there. I put your kid right in front of you. Yeah. And so that kind of eased the whole pain or it kind of eased the momentum of them coming and being aggressive because, look, nice man, garbage shit. is garbage. Yeah. You know, and if he's yeah. not that good, you know, look, I want you to see it. Right. Because, uh, you know, when you first start out, you know, it's new to us. Mm -hmm. You know, it's new to us as, you know, former athletes. And plus, you know, like you said, our kids going to have one up on a lot of situations, right. and especially if our kid is good because my son – before he went to sleep, he had to go over his plays and go over his stuff. Before he went to practice, he had to go over his stuff. And by the time he got to practice, mm -hmm. you know, he already got two, three times of going over all this stuff. Right. So he put in all this extra work. And then I find myself cheating the kid because I don't feel like dealing with the parents or all yeah. that stuff that come with it. Yeah. So my child barely gets to touch the ball or he yeah. barely gets to actually you know, show all that work that he put in. Yeah. So I understand exactly where you're coming from, but it's one of those situations where I don't know if there's a true answer for it. Mm -hmm. You know, because, you know, when it's your child, you're right. spending money, you're going to do whatever it takes to kind of get behind your child. You want to help these other kids. Right. You want to show them the pro way. You want to show them the way you're supposed to do things. Right. And then you also want to watch your child kind of flourish and have success. Yeah. And so you find yourself, you know, being coach versus dad. Facts. And, you know, it took it took some years for me to step away from that. So I stepped away from it. Yeah. And go sit in the stands because, you know, all your life, you know, you never be in the stands. You know, all yeah. my life I didn't be in the I didn't get a chance to get into oh, I I never been in the stands until I was in my thirties. Yeah. You know, in my thirties, that's when I got in the stands. And I'll just sit back and watch. Yeah. And, you know, I hate that it kind of deprives so many other kids of the opportunity mm -hmm. to get all this knowledge that yeah. we've gained over the years. Right. But to barely sit back, sit in the stands, 
watch your child, coach your child mm -hmm. when he get home on the things that he do wrong, the things that he do right. It's the best feeling. But now you're in a situation where, man, I'm cheating so many other kids. So I find myself in that space to where it's, man, dang, I want to help these other kids. Cause you see, it's, man, there's so many kids out there that have so much potential. Right. But everything that comes with the youth football, and especially now, I know it's probably yeah. crazy it's right crazy now, especially now, because bro. like now you got these NILs, you got all these things where they got an opportunity to become four star, five star, and then money's involved. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't see myself really being out there coaching yeah. because of the fact that it takes away from you know, the purity of the situation. Because yeah. you know, I, I always want to help kids. Like when I see kids, I be like, this kid got it. Yeah. This kid can make it. Right. You know, but then you start thinking about all the things you discussed. It's like, is it really worth it? You know, I have friends that, you know, you, you know, you check in with them, they arguing at the park. Yeah. You got they're about to fight, two adults about to fight. And it's all over this this sport, which right. we love. Right. But it take the fun out of it because you know we're older now. You know, we had our run, we had our chance and I don't want to be in a space where it's like you got to be walking on pins and needles yeah. because the parent might say something or I might have to get into this. And all this stuff is for free. Right, right. And for us, it's really not for free because we actually have to come out the pocket. Like, Facts. Facts. I never ask anybody for any money. Yeah. But, you know, the good thing about it is, man, you know, you get you get the chance to see it, do it, see it for yourself. And I've been there. I've done that. My kids in college now, you know, I'd rather just be on the outside looking in, but you just hate it for so many kids. And there's so many great coaches out there. And I, I heard you say that these kids are losing out on some good coaching right. because of things that has nothing to do with playing ball. And I can attest to that. And hopefully we're able to find some kind of common ground or you find a situation yeah. that fits because well, you got some years. Yeah. You got some you got some years to go into or you got some more years to do. Right. Because you got a young one out there. Yeah. And it's and I know as a parent it's hard to let somebody else coach your child. Right. When you send us sin that they're yeah. doing it incorrect. You know what I mean? And, and it's like I don't I don't play that the highest of the high. I got to make sure he knows everything the yeah. right way. And see that's that's the that's the point that I wanna get across is that parents like, listen, bro, at the end of the day, when you got a coach and man, as in James situation where we know the game of football, especially at the youth level, youth level level where we can coach O line, D line, linebacker, cornerback, safety, running back, receiver. Like we have the skill level and the knowledge to coach all that at the youth level. Like when you, it's hard to find a coach that can coach everything. But when you are around the league for so long. You don't think we sit in practice when it's offensive day, when we on the sideline, we not looking at the defense, seeing what they're running, see what the coaches coaching the linebackers, what they coaching the D-line, what they coaching the safety. So we soak in all that knowledge of the proper way of how to play football. And when you guys sit here and you try to tarnish, you know what I mean, people like us, bro, and, and, and give us a bad rep around the city, because you want your kid to be a, a, a star and receiver or a star and running back when we clearly can see that he's a defensive player. Or you want your kid to be a defensive player when he's an offensive player. Like, sometimes y'all got to be realistic with yourself and you got to be realistic with your kid at the end of the day. If your kid is a bona fide star player, you can you you should be one of the coaches where you can sit back and say, I know what my kid's going to do. I ain't got to say nothing. But when you got to run around and do all this, all this complaining, then really, is your kid really, really that good? Because at the end of the day, he's a kid. He still has time to develop. Some of y'all trying to live, what, what the key thing is, some of y'all trying to live through your kid because you didn't make it. So now you're trying to, you're trying to force your kid to be what you want it to be, and you put too much fucking pressure on him. And now that kid, like when you you doing all this hyping and you talking this kid up, and then when the game time comes, he can't handle that. He's ready to shut down because you don't talk to much so much. You telling everybody in the county in, the, in the city on him. <laughs> that he's this and he's that and he's that, this this stud and he's the best player and he's better than every kid out there on the field and he's not and he hears that because you in the car driving home telling everybody that so he right there in the car listening to you. You putting a lot of pressure on your kid 
And if he's not built for that, when that game time comes, he's not going to perform. And sooner or later, he's going to be sitting there looking at the coach crying saying, take me out of the game. That's facts. Because I don't see it happen. I've seen that. Man. I don't see it happen. So <laughs> that's, that's, parents, y'all, y'all, what it is, true. y'all need to chill out and let your kid be a kid and just let them flourish. Because the sooner or later you you keep that putting all that pressure on that kid, you're gonna run that kid away from the sport that you want him to play, that you want him to be. And you wasted all that time. And you wasted all that time. Yeah. But that's that's but that's that's good to hear you say it and it's it's good to hear it from your perspective. And that's part of what we're doing on here, you know, part of the Creative Life uh podcast. You know, we wanna make sure we point out things that's important, not only to you, but also can actually benefit others. You know, and you know, besides the community stuff that you're doing and networking and making all those moves, you know, what are some of the things that you're doing post football life? Let's get away from the kids stuff or the mm-hmm. charitable stuff. But we're talking about Devin Hester that played all those years playing football. When you talk about lifestyle leisure, you're talking about the things that you've created, the position you put yourself in, you know, what are some of the things that you've done to make sure that, say, all that work that I've put in through all those years have put me right here? What are some of the things that you can say, look, these, this is the reward for putting in all that work, putting yourself in position to be able to create the life that you want to live? I would say right now... Uh I'm in a comfortable position in life where I can literally say I can, right now, right now, I feel comfortable where I can stress free right now. I can go to my pill box, collect checks, take them to the bank, go home and relax. You know what I mean? I feel like I, I set myself up and I surround myself by guys when I was in the league, I'm glad I didn't wait too late. Cause a lot of people, what they do, a lot of a lot of a lot of professional athletes, once they done playing, once they get done playing football, they start trying to figure out what's the next journey. What that? What do I got to do to continue to keep income coming in? And a lot of them struggle because if you wait too late to the point where you're done playing to try to figure out what what's next. It may be too late when when you're playing you have a lot of research resources to try to pick brain and figure out what 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 these guys you feel like you're making a lot of money now but when you start hanging around these guys that that's not professional athletes that got money them the ones you need to go ahead and leash on that are, when you first get in the league because that you got to use your platform man and your platform is a professional athlete half the million of the billionaire they don't want nothing from you they just want to say I went out to, went out to eat with Edge and Jane. You know what I mean? I'm finna school him on how I'm making money. You know what I mean? He making football money, but I'm finna show him the real world money. You know what I mean? Commercial. You know what I mean? Businesses. You know what I mean? Investments. Like, you gotta start educating yourself on that stuff. Why you in the league? Why you got an opportunity to be in front of these important people, these people that 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 own stuff. You know what I mean? And so I got to be uh, just to talk about what I got going on. So what I did was the NFL they provide this uh, franchise boot camp every summer. You know what I mean. So if, if guys don't don't know what they want to do in life, they have all these type of classes where they provide at the end of summertime. So I took up this um, franchise boot camp, which was in Michigan, University of Michigan, and we go there for four or five days, and they just school you up on how to. If you want to get in the field of franchising, uh, real estate, or whatever you, the case may be, if you want to get into that, you sit there for from 9 a.m. to to almost 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and they bring in all these top dollar guys, millionaires, billionaires, and they explain to you franchising, commercial real estate, um, housing real estate, whatever the case may be. You go in there, you sit there, you learn. So I said, you know what? You got to be real with yourself. You got to say, this is what I want to do. I don't want to be hands-on. It depends on what type of person you are. Some people like to be hands-on. Some people say, you know what? I don't want to be hands-on. I want to learn. 
how it operates, and I want to be just that guy. I want to pick a simple life where I just go to that pill bar, pick up that check. So I got into real estate. So I do commercial real estate. You know what I mean? And um, it's mail, but it's mailbox money. You know what I mean? Where every month I go pick up a check. You know what I mean? I own, I own a couple um townhomes. You know what I mean? And at the end of the day, you gotta find something that's gonna fit your lifestyle. You know what I mean? Like everybody, <clears throat> if you're going out there trying to chase that that me that billion dollars a year or that that six seven million dollars a year, and you going the wrong investment. And you and one find mistake. yourself losing everything. Yeah, one mistake. One mistake. Find some way you 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 comfortable with living with, bro. Like at the end of the day, if you if if you if you manage your money right, and once you get out of league, everything, all your problems are taken care of. You got a house that's paid off. You got cars that's paid off. Your mama house is paid off. Your mama cars are paid off. In reality, bro, you won. You won. <laughs> you won, bro. Uh-huh. Like in reality, find an investment way. You know what I mean? You making. Six hundred to a million dollars a year. Invest wide where you don't have to touch no principal. But you got everything paid off, bro. That's a win, bro. I In agree. that situation, that's a win, bro. You got a bunch you got I mean, you, you take all those years of playing uh, football, you became great at playing football because you put all that time and energy into it. Facts. I think it's complicated to think that you're gonna be able to just jump into the investment world and, 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 and just kill it. And try you know? to make six, seven million dollars, nah, two million dollars a year. Nah, you got bro. You, you gonna got you gonna invest in the wrong shit and you're gonna lose everything. Yeah, you got you gotta know what you're doing. You gotta make sure you educate yourself and it takes time. I think anything yeah. that you're gonna benefit from takes time. You know, so but but with that being said, you know, as far as the creative life, we wanna talk about, you know, the current state of the Hall of Fame. I know we talked about earlier, we said, okay, what is it going to take or what's your take, why you're not in there, you know, what do you think is going to happen? You know, me, being a person that's inducted into the Hall of Fame, I went in 2020, I really never knew the system or what it takes to actually be in there. So I've been in your position, you know, I sat there, I waited, but everybody has their own take. Mm-hmm. And the one thing that's always been confusing for me, which I don't understand why, is how can you be one of the greatest 100 football players to ever play, and it's two years has gone by since your eligibility, and you're still not in? I mean, I don't know if you have an answer, but... Do you have a take on it, or what's what's the theory behind why it's taking so long for a guy that plays such an important part or important role? Because the game is broken up into three parts. You have offense, defense, and you have special team. This is the greatest specialist to ever play the game, yet he's still not into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. You know, so, you know, it's not something to really sit up there and go back and forth on what's your position, but it's more of stepping into the mindset because right. at the end of the day, one thing I can tell you, as a Hall of Famer that has waited his turn, when you do arrive, you'll be welcome with open arms and you're going to appreciate it. But the frustration and the uncertainty which I know has built up, mm-hmm. you know, what goes on in the mind of a person like Devin Hester that knows he's one of the greatest. Right. I mean, for me, like, and everybody, everybody a Hall of Fame story is different. You know what I mean? Everybody's on it has a different unique to it. Um, mine is, is was brought to my attention, and it's from every all the board members that vote for the Hall of Fame. My situation was probably the most toughest that they told me. You know what I mean? Because it hasn't been a returner that made the Hall of Fame. So you're the first. The first. The first. It hasn't. It has not been a returner that made the Hall of Fame. So obviously, I will be the first when it comes. Um, so it was. You know what I mean? It was a tough decision every year. I know that. Um, I guess every year they vote five guys in. I think five current guys. Five I mean, five. Current guys. Yeah, modern era players. Yeah. Um, 
I do know I was the sixth guy every year. So pretty much I was the last guy for the last two years to get cut. I know that for a fact. I talked to the guy, so I know that for a fact. The story that's been brought up is, listen, D, we know you're going to make it. You know what I mean? It's, it's not a question, you know what I mean? But we just don't know how to put you in there right now. It's a fact. It's, 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 we know you're going to make it. You know what I mean? Um, is it frustrating? Yeah, because at the end of the day, you know what I mean? That's just like your edge, right? If you're a first-round draft pick, if you, if you didn't get drafted in the first round, you would probably be pissed and say, you know what, I don't care where I get drafted, and I don't care what round, you know what I mean? As long as I get drafted, I'm just ready to play football. For Because you know you put in all that hard work, so you know you would be pissed if you didn't get drafted in the first round. My situation, I felt like when I look at the, the, the Hall of Fame, when you look at everybody in the Hall of Fame, everybody has the same resume, the best to ever do it. Stats are just the, the impact that that player brings to the game, right? Whether it's stats, whether it's the, the dumbness that that, per, that that person dominated that position, you know what I mean? So when I look at myself and I say, dang, like, you know what I mean? I know I want an offensive player, you know what I mean? I know I want to start running back. I know I want to start receiver. I know I want to start safety, right? I did kick off and punt return. But at the end of the day, I felt like I was the best to ever do it. And that's why it's so mind-boggling to me because it's like, man, you know what I mean? What is, if, if, if I'm not in it, then what, what do you call a Hall of Famer? I agree. Like, what do you call a Hall of Famer? If I, if I'm, if, the best right, to right ever now, do it. Right now, if you, if, if you ask... And if you if you make a list of the top four Hall of Famers in the country right now in the world, Brian, Brian Mitchell, um, who else we got? We got uh, say Leon Washington. Uh, we got uh, who else? We got Josh Creel. If you just name them three right now, and you say, "Listen, bro," if you was in the category to make the Hall of Fame, you and what other person do you feel like you would have to compete against? Devin Hester. I bet you a million dollars they gonna say me. If you had to pick one guy that would go in before you, we know you're gonna make it, but it's one guy gonna go in before you, who would you pick? Name any person in the NFL history, name one person. Who would you pick? I bet you they gonna say me. Right? So when you name when you when you speak of a coach and you ask a coach like who you feel like the best Hall of Fame when it comes to kickoff and point return, they gonna say me. Right. It's hands down. Bro, listen, I, I I when they changed the kickoff rule, you don't you know why they changed that? Because of me. You know what I mean? We I, my special team coach told me to my face, bro. He said, listen, we had a meeting. All the special team coaches had a meeting to move the kickoff. Did they agree to move the kickoff return up or keep it the same? I think it was 32 teams at the time. He said, all 31 said, let's move it up because we don't have Devin Huston. All 32 said that. We want to move it up because we ain't got Devin Huston. Yeah, and okay. all of them in the meeting now, 32 teams, 31 of them said, let's move it up because we don't have Devin Huston. That's why the rule was made. So when you got a guy that's changing the rule, the changing the game, and then you have a guy that, you know what I mean, he's not an offensive threat, a defensive threat, but at the end of the game, he's in the game plan for this coach to say, you know what I mean, the keys to the game is not to kick the ball to Devin Hustle. When you got a game plan game, game plan around a certain player, that person deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. And there you have it. So, you know, I'm an advocate for Devin Hester being in the Hall of Fame. I know it's going to happen. It's just a matter of when. If you come through that gauntlet, you already know. We're going to throw them U's up. You are we're going to do what we do. And we're going to bring them Chevys out. You we're going to do right. that. So, But, no, nah, it was it was great to have you on the show, man. Like, it was a pleasure covering all the things that we got a chance to cover. You know, I wish we had more time. But, as always, you'll be a repeat coming here, and we're going to keep this thing going because football season is right about – because football season is right around the corner, 
and you know we got so much football to talk about. So oh, yeah. I appreciate you, and let's keep it going. Let's do it, baby.